Ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, welcome back to another episode of Triple B TV. And today we've got a staple of the show at this point. He's, uh, you could call him a regular, I suppose, Mr. Vin Russo. And he's brought some cool boas we're going to check out. We're going to talk about the possibilities of expansion on his works of book, book of works, <laughs> going forward. You're watching Triple B TV. The last time we sat down, well, we haven't sat down for a while. The last time we chatted was over Zoom. Right. Which we, you were one of the better ones over Zoom, I would say. I didn't, I didn't like doing them over Zoom at all. Oh, yeah. It was cool to get to see your bass collection, though. That oh, was That thanks. was sweet. And then I just learned that you do the bonsai stuff. But what, what has, I mean, and of course you got the new book. It's printed. You know, it's well, the last time we spoke here at Tindley Park, we talked about this being written. Right. So now it's done. You know, now it's printed and it's out. It's been out for a year and change now. So, is that one page that Aurora found? Is that still happening, or is it? Yes, there's still a, a page missing. Is it? But is it just a, a blank, random blank page? No, like it's just like it just skipped over. Yeah. Oh, you mean? Oh, it's not. It's not just a, a random blank page. Like there's actually just a page missing. There's one page missing. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which page is it? Let's not talk about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's just, I think to me, it's like when they accidentally print the 7-Eleven cans upside down or something. It's like, it's like a baseball card. It's a collector's right. item. Like, you've got to get the one. Missing on yeah. It. Right, right. Yeah, the one. There's only one out of the 10,000. <laughs> you know, we all have it. <laughs> Let's let Phil uh, do his thing. He's going to be all loud with his speaker right over us. Nice. I'm wondering if they beat the, uh, I wonder if they beat the 125,000 from Daytona. The last time. It was some heavy bidding going on. Really? There was some heavy bidding going on, yeah. Oh, just 5,000 under the record from Daytona. That's still but, good. You know, think it's about still it. Good. Year, couple, just a couple years ago, a good one was 30,000, right? So now it's 120, 125,000 they're raising to pay for fighting for people's rights to keep reptiles. That's yeah, pretty good. That's because fantastic. Show you how much more money is circulating through our industry, you know, how far it's coming. It's a big deal. Yeah, it is. And it's it's crucial to keeping it going. Like, showing that issue, that's a way that, unfortunately, legislation will gauge, you know. Like. Right. It's a shame because it, we need to show that we have um, the money to pay for lobbyists to fight for us. And paying for lobbyists is, is expensive on, on the Hill, you know, Capitol Hill. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. You're good. I just want to make sure we're capturing yeah. it nice and, right. nice, nice and tight. It's an interesting time, but we'll see it. It is definitely growing, and like there's this thing brewing that I can feel. I'm sure most oh, a lot yeah. of us can feel this like precipice of like we're either going to survive it or we're going to get pushed back further. And it's like building right now. It feels well, like. Well, I've been in it for 35 years or more, and I've seen it go from nothing to a multi-billion-dollar industry. So. I don't think it's going to go backwards. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> you know, I haven't seen it for as long as you have. When I first steady. started doing this as a kid, people thought I was nuts. Oh, you're breeding snakes. Who breeds snakes? Who's buying snakes? What are you doing with snakes? Oh, he's the snake kid, you know? But it's like now it's a, a full-time occupation for me, so. Yeah, that's sweet. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you got your book. Yeah, we we've obviously we sat down and talked so much. Like, I feel like we're we're good, pretty decent friends at this. We point. are, man. Yeah. Definitely. I, I enjoy it. You're the, from the first time we sat down. I was like, dude, you were very pleasant to talk to. And then when I came by and I was doing the head banging segment, you were all game. Right. I was like, thanks <laughs> for like being so like smart and like knowledgeable and also fun and like open to just like being. Well, awesome. I used to be a headbanger. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. I had really long hair when I was young. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, let's well, let's look at the the animals that you brought to the show, dude. Sure. Let's start with um, we'll start with the blood boas. You know, the last show we did here in Tinley, the blood boas were were spoken about too. But you know, every year we we come to another level in color. You know, we're trying to get them redder and redder and redder. Um, you know, now I'm up to mixing in other traits and obviously this is hypo and blood so um it's, it's got a lot of red in it i mean look at the the you know even underneath you flip them over and there's there's a ton of red in them it might be hard to capture on i'm getting some nice iridescence at the same time right now yeah, too. yeah yeah so 
it's something I've been working on for 20 years, pulling out the red, breeding red for red, um, picking out the reddest ones and then keeping them and breeding them to make redder ones. And it really has seemed to compound itself. It's not like it's just um, random. You know, the red snakes make really red snakes, so. And this is, it's not, it's not anything new, the, the blood boa trait. But yeah, I yeah think, we've been talking about it yeah, for years. You've been working it for years. I'm trying to perfect it and get them as red as I can. People love red. I, I say, I make a joke. People are like parrots. They like color. You know, parrots feed on color. They eat, they eat colorful food. And um, people like color. Things that are devoid of color, you know, they either like something jet black or they want something super red. They don't want anything really dull. You know? well, there's a reason we have the cones in our eyes. There's there's something to the, the color for us, you know. Right, right, it's, right. But yeah, color is what, what does it for, for for you know, people walk by the table and they see a, a row of these and they're like, Wow, those are red. And they really are. Red makes you hungry too. <laughs> does, does it? Yeah. It's a power color, right? It is. If you yeah, wear it's a it at a job and, interview. And red and like all the fast like Carl's Jr., McDonald's, all the things that red and yellow are the colors, those right, two colors right, in right. combo, like for whatever reason spark hunger yeah. and desire for really to drink. yeah <laughs> that's why they use it that's why those that's why red and yellow is like in and out like all these places these food places red right and, red and yellow exactly so these are something i'm proud of that i've been working on a long time and they do well at shows i bring them the i have to sell them at shows because it's it's really difficult to capture the color in a photograph and when people see them Every time they see them in person, they're like, wow, they really are that red, Vin. They're redder in person. That's what everybody says. They're That's redder true. As person. good as technology has come with cameras and right. lighting and being able to balance out and post, like capturing the full dynamic range as much right. as possible, there's still the, something that the, the eye captures that you just can't capture exactly. in a photo, like you're saying. Exactly. And as much as, as good as your photography is sometimes, like it's... The way that they, the movement, the tricking of the light that happens as it's moving through right. your hands in person and watching it, you know, it's and it's the way the spectrums are interpreted through the lenses in the the digital film, so to speak, you know. Definitely good looking snakes, man. All right, so that's one thing I'm working on. Well, I've been working on a long time. But I just started working on something new, and it's something new and it's something old combined. Um, years ago, I was in Europe, and um, I was at a, a reptile show in Germany with my friend Frake. He's from Holland, Frake Nort. And uh, there was a guy selling um, Coop's Pastel Boas. They're Colombian boas that are really colorful. And I've been breeding those for a couple of years now, more than a couple of years, probably 10, 15 years. And people know I have them and they buy them from me. They're a good seller. They're a very colorful pastel Colombian boa. But I was looking at one this year. I'm like, what would it look like if I mixed IMG into it, you know? So I mixed an IMG into them and came out with this like pretty cool snake. Let's hope we can get to catch the color, but it's like a rusty sheen on it. Um, and this is young for being this dark. So IMG, if anybody doesn't really know, is increasing, increasing melanin, melanin gene. gene. And um, as they shed and get older, they get darker, darker, darker. But I've noticed that snakes that have a lot of red in them, the red kind of sticks behind under the black. Really? Yeah. So I've seen a couple other projects that some other breeders are working on that, that they've added some red in. And these snakes, when they get old, they keep like a reddish tail with a reddish hue on top of that black. So I'm hoping this happens with this, and I got a feeling it will. Yeah, red and black are. Yeah, that's hot. Yeah, everybody uh, wants something. Like really Tarahumara cool. mountain king snakes, like. Yeah, they got that pink and black. Yeah, and just like when you get when you get that deep red and combine with the black. I'm, yeah, yeah. For me yeah. personally, those are like my two favorite colors. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cool. So I'm hoping this works out. I made these in a hypomorph too, which are really pink. Because some of those IMGs will depend on whatever's mixed in with them, or just the IMG by itself will just end up being sometimes almost jet black, right? Solid black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think the trick, well, not the trick, but the goal is to try and get some color on top of and under that black that bleeds through. And, and from what you've seen so far, the red is the way to work that Yeah, in. red is manifests itself under that black pretty well. So that's what we're working on, too, at Cutting Edge. And I also 
mixed the IMG into some blood boas too last year. Um, I know a couple other guys have, d have done it too, and, and that's going to be really hot. So, oh, look under the chin. There's so many of intricate. Oh, the patterning under the chin is incredible. Hey, don't focus back on the background, you. There was there was a really good shot there of under the chin. Oh, that underbelly is absolutely phenomenal. Right. Yeah, because you know cool. it's a pastel, so there's going to be lots of pinks on the underbelly too. So. And speaking of pinks, that neck snake, dude. Yeah, let's look at that. Obviously, everybody knows me for locality boas. Um, I've been working on locality boas my whole life. So um, back in the late 80s, a guy named Joe Terry, I mentioned it in my book, got um, some Bolivian boas. They came in in a shipment into uh, Florida from Bolivia. I think at the time there was maybe two or three total snakes. That's it. Bolivian boa, boa constrictor amarelli. They came in a shipment with blue and gold macaws, um, which are indigenous to B Bolivia, too. And um, he ended up getting a pair of these snakes, and he bred them. And I remember when they first came out, my, my friend, my good friend um, Tom Burke had a pair from Joe Terry way back when. And uh, I remember seeing them being like, that is the coolest snake I've ever seen. That I need those. So in time, I ended up getting some of the Joe Terry stuff. Um, but this is a true blue Bolivian boa constrictor amarelli. Now, the thing I was noticing on your table um, with these snakes, as we, we talked about, was how similar that, that pink coming through reminded me of uh, Occidentalis. And, you know, they're yeah. not too far away from Argentina. Yeah, they're not that too far. Bolivia is not far from Argentina. And um, as a matter of fact, when I was down in South America, I ended up going to like a little bookstore and found a book on snakes. And there was a photo in there of w one of these, an Amarelli, that was so dark and cryptic that I thought the photo was of an Occidentalis. But then I read the caption, you know, Bolivian boa, you know, from who knows where. I should have, I should have uh, bought the book, but I literally just read it in, in a bookstore. Little did I know that I would have needed that information later on. But um, for all we know, the snakes that are in the, in the range between this, where this was found in, in Argentina could be similar looking snakes. They're all, through DNA sequencing, they're all considered boa constrictor now. They're all constrictor not constrictor constrictor right but this is to me is still considered constrictor amarelli because to me i think it's a valid subspecies you know dna tells us a lot of things but evolution tells us other things too snakes evolve in different climates and different environments to look different from their neighboring um cousins so to speak that could be they could share identical dna but they're still different you know, they're, they've evolved differently. So these are unique snakes. And they were almost lost to culture for a while there. I mean, you don't really see too many of them around. But luckily, I've kept a, a little veritable Noah's Ark of these. And I do breed them every couple of years or every other year, I'd say. But it's a, a pretty it's almost like it's, it's like a steel blue yeah. and pink. What do you think the pink is like? Because it's, obviously it's in Argentines as well. Like what is that pink that's there as babies and then and then fades away what do you well you know baby snakes evolve you know they change as they grow um, right. some of these Bolivian adults keep that pink and orange some of them do um, a lot of them stay this steel gray color you know it gets it gets shadowed over but they're highly variable snakes and it's amazing to me that this entire bloodline started with just a pair of snakes but yet the, the, the offspring that I've been creating for years are pretty variable. Some of them have the pink in them, some of them don't. It's definitely an intriguing snake, man. Yeah, definitely. There's something, something prehistoric about it, you know? It's, it's exactly what Mother Nature intended. There's no, there's no frills, you know? It's nothing yeah. added. Super wicked, man. And some of them have super high widow's peaks, like really peaked. And some of them have these blocky saddles like this one does. Beautiful snakes and Great information snake. as always, man. What, what, uh, is there 
version three of the book in the works? Is there like what you got any big projects you're working on coming up going forward? You know, the book. I think I think the the more complete is about as more we're gonna go at this. We're point. not gonna go most yeah, complete. I don't know if we can go most. <laughs> You know, I really don't know if we can go that far. But you, you never know. I mean, I didn't think I'd do this one. Because the first one I thought was, that's it. This is all I can come up with, you know? And that was in 2006, the first one. And here we are, 2020, 2021. And I did the second one. And I'm like, I'm starting to see stuff that I pretty much left out because it, there's so much overshadowing, so much, so much going on in the industry that you can't, it, you can't possibly keep up. It's like an iPhone, you know? So you're saying that most is most likely going to come as, as inconceivable as it seems at the moment because right. more just came. Because in 10 years or 15 years, and there may be even more. So who knows? We'll see. I've got a great relationship with the publishers, and they're always making new things and coming up with new things. So for all we know, this whole series in time, because we're still young guys. We're not that old. You know, Bob Ashley may say, hey, Vin, we're going to do a whole nother series and might not even have the words more, most, you know, <laughs> it might just be the boa constrictor. This is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, like or it, or uh, extension or volume 10 or whatever. Or boa's, boa's 110 instead of 101, you know. We'll see. That's good, man. Yeah, well, yeah. I look forward to it then. Cool. It's always a pleasure, dude. Hi, my brother. Always. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you as always to Vin for being so awesome. And from the moment we've met Vin to today, he's just been a solid guy and a great person to talk to about snakes. And we, I, we can sit here and talk. At some point, I'll have to go out there because you know we, we got limited time with the show. He's got a Vin. We can't just sit and talk forever about everything. I'd love to get in the weeds with Vin sometime and maybe up at his place. But uh, as we have been doing with all of these Triple B TV episodes, tonight we'll be having a Zoom call Q&A with Vin Russo. If you'd like to join us for that, there's a link down in the description. I'll tell you how. And we'd love to see you there. And until next week, you can watch Triple B TV. Y'all take care. All right, bro. Yeah, right after this, I'll call you. Um, yeah, just keep, keep that thing about like about a fist from your, your mouth like this. It'll be like perfect. You can Am I going right in here? here? Yeah, just, just, yeah, it comes, it picks in from the front of it for sure. All but, right. And that's perfect. Um.